Here, here is where you can lay it down, lay down all that you have carried, the weight of the world that has rounded your back, leaving you aching and exhausted. Here, here is where healing begins, where burdens are set down and alongside one another's, their magnitude, does not seem as great. Here, here is where you can bring your unbounded joy and jubilation and risk letting hope into your heart again. Here, here is where you can rest if you are weary and where nothing is expected but that you bring all of who you are into the presence of the holy and of this loving community. Come, let us worship together. Our opening song is There is a Love, written by um, music director Beth Norton in Concord and words by the Reverend Dr. Uh, Rebecca Parker. I thought it was a great song for us this morning. If you don't know it, um, the video that we'll be playing 
will have me singing first and it alternates between verses of there is a love holding me and then there is a love holding us so we'll alternate back and forth but you'll hear me first and then um, I'm so grateful for the choir in making some virtual choir recordings to go with this today. So please sing along as we go along. There is a love. There is a love holding me. There is a love holding all that I love. There Let us now light the chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. We invite you to light a candle, a chalice at home if you have one nearby. We light this flame, enduring symbol of our collective commitment to lead with truth and compassion. Please join us now in saying our congregational covenant. We covenant to Speak honestly and listen deeply to each other and the voice within. Treat each other with compassion and honor our differences. Take responsibility for the impact of our words, actions and inactions, the impact they have on each other. Support each other in times of need and of grief and celebrate the beauty and joy in our lives. Honor the gifts of the past and be gentle with each other as we grow. Encourage each other in the brave work of creating a more beloved community and a healthy, sustainable world and forgive each other and start again. I'm Liza Earl Centers, Director of Lifespan Spiritual Exploration. 
Marissa here, is my helper this morning. And Virtus and Marissa and I are going to together tell our story for all ages. Our story this morning is connected with this month's theme, which is healing. And to help introduce it, we have the Wonder Box here. Marissa, will you, uh, do you want to make a guess? It's kind of jangly, maybe some ornaments. Ornaments, okay. She's going to show us. Looks like some pieces of glass. Oh no, it broke. Just kidding. Good job being careful with that. Virtus actually asked me to put a broken cup in the Wonder Box this morning. And when I asked him why, he said it had to do with something called tikkun olam. And since that is a new phrase, for many of us, I invite you to repeat it after me right now. Tikkun olam. olam. And Virtus, I know that the middle schoolers in Crossing Paths studied this in their study of Judaism last year, but will you remind us what tikkun olam means and what does it have to do with a broken cup? Oh, sure. Um, the term tikkun olam means repairing the world in the Jewish faith. It describes the work that it takes to make our world more safe, healthy, and fair. In the spirit of healing, let us consider the myth known as the shattering of the vessels. And this is inspired by an adaptation written by the Reverend Amy Petrie Shaw, who uses love to describe God. And it goes a little bit like this. At the beginning of time, before anything else existed at all, love was all there was, and they filled up everything in the whole universe. But love got bored and lonely, and there was no one to be in love with. So one day, love decided to make a world. First, they took a deep breath. And I wonder if all of you watching or listening can take a deep breath with love. All right, how deep can we go? Let's take one more breath with love. Hmm. See, love got all squished up thinking um, and taking the deepest breath ever and was so squished that they squeezed out darkness. And the darkness was all around, thick and shiny. The darkness was beautiful, but now love couldn't see anything. So love waved their arms and legs around, but the darkness was everywhere. And then love said, I have to do something about this. So they thought for a moment, and try to think of the most wonderful, beautiful, warm thoughts ever. Love thought harder and harder. And all of a sudden, love called out, I want light. And pop, all of the warm and wonderful, beautiful thoughts exploded outward into 10 different directions and shaped themselves into 10 big glowing glass balls. Each ball was filled with a shining, spinning lump of pure light and warmth. Some of the spare good thoughts that couldn't fit into the glass became dust and water vapor and seeds and molecules that could form animals. And Love said, This is amazing, but I better make something for the light to shine on. So loved waved their arms and kicked their legs and all of the dust and water vapor and molecules that had been scattered around when the dust, when the, when the glass balls formed, began to form into another huge ball. This one of dirt and water and plants and animals. And Love said, I will call this one Earth. 
and the ten balls of light started toward the earth. And if they had made it there in one piece, the entire planet would have been exactly the way love wanted. But the glass balls were too fragile to contain such strong, powerful, wonderful, good thoughts. They broke open and shattered. And all of the good thoughts shattered and flew out like sparks. They scattered like the sands and like the seeds and like stars. Those broken pieces fell everywhere on the earth into tiny bits instead of bigger pieces like love intended. Then love said, Oh no, I am too big. I will never be able to find all of those tiny pieces. I have to make one more thing to help. So we all know what love did, right? So love waved their arms and kicked their feet one more time. And people appeared on the earth. And they didn't know it, but they were created for one job. And that is to find these sparks, these tiny pieces of wonderful goodness and to bring them together again into one big piece of love. And then love said, When the people gather enough pieces together, I will recreate the big glass containers to hold them. And this time I will set them down a little more carefully. So you see, all of us from the time we are born have a job and that job is to find love and more good and warm and wonderful things. And if we do that, we are healing the world. So, Virtus, the kids, I'm trying to think of examples of this, the kids who drew Abnaki words for our churchyard out this month to lift up the Abnaki language. Is that an example of tikkun olam? Oh yes, in all different ways people of, in our congregation help uh, to share food with those who don't have any. And, and the, the ways that people in our congregation pick up trash like the trash tramps or the people trying to reduce the carbon that they put out in the earth. Oh yes, and people who donate money to groups helping to make the world a more fair and peaceful place. This is all part of great healing. And our story of our ages is over, but Tikkum Olam is the work of our entire lives. <laughs> Thank you both. of your life and wait there patiently. Until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how 
love to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. And would you please join me in the spirit of prayer? These words of prayer are inspired by the words of Amanda Eudis Kessler. Spirit of life and compassion, we arrive into this moment that has held so much anticipation and that portends so much for the future. We arrive with tears that have fallen for the years of harm, loss, and pain, tears and anguish for all who are not yet free. We arrive with the glimmers of hope of what might be, of what we could rebuild and restore, of what might yet be saved. We arrive in this moment in need of strength, knowing that it is yet a long road to justice, to freedom, to an earth sustained and healed by our care. May we be filled with a compassionate yearning to be made whole, to reach out to every soul beside us with love and care, to know our neighbor, not as enemy, but as kin. May the lightness of this day sustain our hearts and our spirits and fuel us for what is to come. Blessed be, amen.
I have two readings to share with you this morning. The first is a selection from the book, Repair, the Impulse to Restore in a Fragile World by Elizabeth V. Spellman. The human being is a repairing animal. Repair is ubiquitous, something we engage in every day and in almost every dimension of our lives. Homo sapiens is also homo repairans. From apologies and other informal attempts at patching things up to law courts, conflict mediation, and truth and reconciliation commissions, we try to reweave what we revealingly call the social fabric. No wonder then that homo repairans is always and everywhere on call. We, the world we live in, and the objects and relationships we create are by their very nature things that can break, decay, unravel, fall to pieces. To repair is to acknowledge and respond to the fracturability of the world in which we live in a very particular way, not by simply throwing our hands up in despair at the damage or otherwise accepting without question that there is no possibility of or point in trying to put the pieces back together, but by employing skills of mind, hand, and heart to recapture an earlier moment in the history of an object or a relationship in order to allow it to keep existing. And the second reading is a short excerpt from the book of poetry, The Dream of a Common Language by Adrian Rich. My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. Lately, I have been remembering back to four years ago, the Sunday after the 2016 election. The sanctuary where I stand today, as opposed to this morning, was packed. Over 300 people gathered into the pews that I am looking at, as well as standing in the back and on the side aisles. Our need to be together overcame the concern for abiding by the fire code for that hour of worship. So many people, some of you who are joining in for worship this morning and others who have now gone their own way, were compelled to come to church by fear, shock, confusion, desperation. The outcome of that election indeed came, to, came as a shock to many, and it felt like a moment of reckoning and soul searching. Many of us wondered, how could it have been that someone who had campaigned with such racist ideas and rhetoric, who had demeaned women and people with disabilities, who stoked fear of immigrants, could be elected to the highest office of this country. I don't think the need for that reckoning and soul searching has gone away, nor will it go away anytime soon, even with the projected change in national political leadership. These last four years for many people have proven to be as harmful as they had imagined it might be. For too many people, the last four years have not only felt like an assault on their dignity and sense of safety, but have come with real tangible policies that have torn apart families, endangered access to health care, and put at risk basic human rights. Especially for these individuals, the projected change in the White House brings a sense of relief. 
And for anyone who has lamented a lack of decency and empathy from the highest office or any reflection of their held values, the outcome of the election also brings a sense of relief. And if this is true for you, I invite you to let some of that tension out of your body right now. Unclench your jaw or let out a big sigh. If you feel like you've been holding your breath the last four years or even longer, let out a big exhale. Today, regardless of your political viewpoints, I think we can all hope for a peaceful transfer of power and with it, the door of possibility opened to an easing of at least some of the pain caused by the brokenness within our social fabric. In his victory speech last night, President-elect Joe Biden paraphrased the book of Ecclesiastes in the Hebrew Bible. He said, the Bible tells us that to everything there is a season, a time to build, a time to reap, a time to sow, and a time to heal. And then he said, this is the time to heal in America. This is the time to heal in America. Of course, no single election result fixes everything. No single leader can bring about healing or end strife alone. There is no magic wand or spell that can end generations of systemic racism or eradicate poverty or bring us out of the climate crisis or completely restore our faith and our trust in one another. That which divides us and polarizes us and keeps us from living in true communion with one another is persistent and tenacious in its grip. In our own community here in central Vermont, these divisions may not appear as stark. We benefit from an ethos of communitarianism in which people come together to support one another and to seek solutions to the issues and challenges that arise in our shared public life. Yet, we too live in this fragmented world while the bonds amongst those we call neighbor may be stronger and more resilient in some respects, we are not immune to the spread of white nationalistic extremism or the insidiousness of white supremacy. We too grapple with how to move forward in a world with a rapidly destabilizing climate. We too are at a loss for words at times when confronted with ideas and rhetoric that are anathema to our own worldviews. It is time to heal in America, but where do we even begin? As Adrian Rich writes, my heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. To reconstitute the world, we have to start with repairing what we can, wherever we can. In my house here in Montpelier, we tend to hang on to broken things, the bowl that was accidentally pushed off the dining room table, the broken doorknob. We have quite a collection in our basement. And I imagine many of you also feel this need to fix broken things, or at least not to discard broken items right away, to repurpose or mend whenever possible, to extend the life of things that might otherwise be judged to be unrecoverable. As I was getting ready for worship just a few moments ago, I went out behind the sanctuary and I happened to find, I'm sure someone knows the story of this pot 
perhaps intentionally broken into many pieces, but then put back together with the words reuse written inside. Our repair instinct is strong. As Elizabeth Spellman writes, to repair is to acknowledge how easily fractured the world can be and to respond not by throwing one's hands up in despair, but by putting to use the skills of mind, hand, and heart to restore something of what was. The story that Liza and Virtus shared with us earlier speaks to this idea, the story from the Jewish tradition of the shattering of the vessels teaches us about the meaning of tikkun olam, or repair of the world. I think there's something incredibly powerful in the images of this story. One can imagine and sense the fragility of the vessels holding the divine light. The light that we know is at our core that sense of wholeness exists, yet it can feel scattered and hidden. Our work, the story says, is to seek out and find that light. Healing the world means recognizing the brokenness in the world and within ourselves and bringing back together those broken and fragmented pieces. The task of healing the world may sound daunting, yet it is not any of ours to do alone. This is a collective task, and we each have our role to play. The doctor and writer Rachel Naomi Remen reflects on this story and the idea of tikkun olam, and she says, this is, of course, a collective task. It involves all people who have ever been born, all people presently alive, all people yet to be born. We are all healers of the world. And that story opens a sense of possibility. It's not about healing the world by making a huge difference. It's about healing the world that touches you, that's around you. And she asks, how would you live if you were exactly what is needed to heal the world. And let me tell you that you are what is needed to heal the world, each and every one of you. And before diving again into that task, now that we have seen our way through most of this election season, First, I would say, take some time to heal your own heart. If you have been heartbroken again and again, especially in the past several years, allow some joy into your life. To bring healing into this moment, let's remember that yes, there is work to do, and joy exists alongside it. It is joy that can give us the fuel to keep on going through the uncertainty that still lies ahead, through the unrest that may yet come. There is the joy of seeing even more diverse representation in our elected officials with trans men and women winning office across the country, including here in Vermont, where we will have our first trans lawmaker serving in our house. There is the joy of little girls and children everywhere seeing a vice president elect that looks like them and tells them to follow their dreams. There is the joy of pouring your heart into calling voters and writing postcards and letters and seeing the swelling of the electorate to historic numbers. There is the joy of music and spontaneous dance parties filling the streets with people of different ages and races and abilities and gender identities feeling a collective sense of possibility. 
Dear ones, cry the tears that must be shed. Laugh and sing and dance. And know that it is our minds and our hands and our hearts that will do the mending, that can restore that which seems to be destroyed, that can heal and reconstitute the world one broken shard at a time. So may it be. And now let us join in our closing song. My life flows on and endless song. Sing along from wherever you are. And I share with you these closing words by the Reverend Mr. Barb Grieve, inspired by the Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman's The Work of Christmas. When the glee of the progressives is stilled, when the posters in yards are removed, when the lawyers and politicians and pundits are quiet, when the protesters are safely home, the work of democracy begins to prioritize the vulnerable, to reunite the caged ch children, to feed the hungry, to house the houseless, to release the prisoner, to decriminalize poverty, to provide health care for all, to educate the masses, to care for the earth, to protect the vote, to let life flourish. Go now in peace, all.